Give these guys a round of applause. Let them know how much you appreciate them and the incredible job they do every Sunday. And before you sit down today, first of all, are you happy to be here? Yeah. Good, good, good. Y'all are, y'all are happier than the last crowd, okay? You really are. Um, but before you sit down, I want you to do me a big favor. We always talk about the church being a family and this church being a big family. But it's funny sometimes because our own family doesn't know the names of other family members. And so that being said, I want you to find maybe just two people. Go introduce yourself to them. I want you to learn their name, remember their name. There will be a test at the end of the service, all right? Do that real quick for me, all right? Find somebody you don't know. You guys are awesome. Y'all really, you really did it. Thank you so much. Great. Give yourself a hand, okay? And you just made a new friend today, all right? Very good. Go ahead and have a seat as you sit down. Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, uh, I really, I really, 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 really do think that I'm going to let you out early today, okay? I know some of you don't believe me, but that is the plan, okay? Um, but we wrap up this whole series The name of the series is called The Force, and we've been talking about God's Holy Spirit, the force that works in and through us, the person of the Holy Spirit, and what he does, how he comes to live inside of us but doesn't leave us as we are. He transforms us. He changes us, making us more and more into the character of Jesus Christ. And today is the final episode. We're talking about what I call the victorious life. Uh, Grab your Bibles, your pens your notes. I'm really am going to have you write down some stuff and circle some important things in scripture today that I want to draw your attention to. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, is, uh, again, we come to you here on Sunday to, to praise you, to worship you, to exalt your name, to glorify you. Um, at the same time, Father, we ask that you would transform us. And the love that you have given to us through your son, Jesus Christ, starts that fire inside of us. And Father, I pray that our hearts will be melted and that your spirit will have his way to shape us and to make us into being just like your son, Jesus Christ. And so again, Father, we say, have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys here on this uh, Memorial Day weekend, um, I'm sure you have plans. I'm sure you've thought about a lot of different things, maybe what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. I want to welcome those who are watching us online because you've decided to tune in on this important holiday weekend, and maybe you're at the beach, the mountains, the lake, wherever it is you are, but we are here today to worship the Lord, and as we worship him, I want something to be on our minds, okay? I want something to be on our minds. In fact, I want a person to be on our minds, and that person is Colonel Sanders, okay? (laughs) Now, now, wait, before before anybody gets mad at me and says, Pastor Bo, stop it, Um, Memorial Day weekend is not about fried chicken, I'm not talking about that Colonel Sanders. Instead, I want you to think about Colonel Sanders. Eugene Sanders. Uh, Colonel Eugene Sanders is, is a longtime friend here of Community Bible Church, and, and uh, he was here for years, and then he, he moved back out to his home place where he, where he was originally from in Portland, Oregon. Uh, would watch continuously here online with Forrest, and, and uh, he, one of my, one of my uh, biggest encouragers, as he's watching online from out in Oregon, he would send messages to me, and and encouraging words, and when he was here on campus, uh, he'd give you one of those really strong handshakes and, and a nod of his head, and, and uh, you just knew you had been encouraged by Colonel Eugene Sanders, but sadly, Colonel Sanders passed away April 22nd, a little over a month ago, and as we read his obituary, 
uh, you kind of find yourself amazed at the life that this man had because when he was 17 years old, he enlisted in the Army, 101st Airborne. He was sent over to Vietnam where he served. Not only, though, in Vietnam, well, in Vietnam, he got, ended up getting a Bronze Star of Valor. He went on to serve in Korea where we would help those who are locals learn English and, and, and help, help those doing some training in military tactics. He served in Hawaii, just an extensive career. In fact, he even achieved the highest level of security in the armed forces. And then he retired, but I got to tell you something. After he retired, he didn't, he didn't really retire. You know those types, right? The type that says, you know, I still got a mission to complete. I've still got a duty to do. I've still got somewhere I've got to, I've, I've got to serve, and that's exactly what he did. He would continue to serve right here in Atlanta. He was the cook at, for years and years, the head cook at a homeless shelter. Not only that, he went and served at the local food bank, and, and some of you might know this, but he even helped start a ministry here at this church called Celebrate Recovery which has impacted so, so many lives. Even, even out there in the coffee bar, he would go and he would be one of our baristas from time to time. And then, probably the most dangerous duty of all, every year he would go with our teenagers to summer camp <laughs> and serve there in security for us. And that was Colonel Eugene Sanders. And why do I bring him up? And why do I want you to think about Colonel Sanders on Memorial Day weekend? It's because I want you to think about the heart of a soldier, the heart of a warrior, the heart of, 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 of somebody who wants to serve, the heart of somebody who is willing to sacrifice in such a big way to lay down their life so that others may live. And the reason I want you to think about that is because that's where we find ourselves when we're asking at the end of our life whether or not our life was worth something or if it was simply a waste. At the end of my life, at the end of your life, will I, will you be able to look back and go, that was a win, not a waste. It wasn't always easy, it wasn't always fun. In fact, at times it was a battle, it was difficult, it was a struggle, but all in all, that was a win and not a waste. And that's where we find ourselves here today as the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to do the same thing. Timothy, I want you to think like a soldier. I want you to think about what life, what, what in life really does matter, and that's what I want you to go after, and that's what I want you to pursue it's today what I call the four essentials for victory. I'm going to begin this morning by reading Zechariah 4, 6. And I don't have this screen here today, uh, but we'll flash it up here and you have it there in your notes. And, and then on to 2 Timothy where I want you to circle some important things. But Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, It's not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. I think for so many of us, as we grow up, we rely so heavily on our own strength from time to time, on our own power from time to time. But, but have you ever gotten to that place in life where you're just out of strength? Anybody? You're worn out, right? Have you ever gotten to that place where you feel like you got no more power, even power to live? Huh? Yeah. Have you ever gotten to that place where you're stressed out? And at the end of our rope there, what do we find? We find when we can't, then God can. When I can't, God can. And that was the point all along where God says, hey, you know what? You can keep trying. You can do this and this and this and chase it. But it's not by your power and it's not by your strength. But where the real power in life comes from is where? By my spirit. By my spirit, says the Lord. And what that means for you and I today, if we want our life to matter, if we want our life to become anything of worth or value, if we want it to be a win, it can't be my own effort and my own strength. I have to be at that place where I go, God, have your way with me. 
May your spirit work through me and move through me. May you accomplish in me something that I cannot accomplish in myself. May you bring the wind as you transform me into being more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. And that's the power of God's spirit working in and through us if we so choose. But then Paul says this to Timothy. You see, Timothy is Paul's protege. He wants him to win at what he's been called to. And so he says, Timothy, you got to think about this. You got to have this mind. You got to think like that soldier, that Roman soldier that you see over there and how they operate and how they act. Have that same kind of mind. Have a Colonel Sanders kind of mind. And he says this Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And he says, soldiers, they don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. Now, that's a simple verse, but a lot packed in it. And in fact, here's what I want you to do. Take your pen, and I want you to circle the four things. And there are going to be some words I'm going to have you circle, and then I'm going to outline them real quick, and then we will get out of here this morning. But the first word I want you to circle is the first word in this verse, and it's the word endure. Endure. And that's going to be the first one we're going to talk about this morning. The second word is the word suffering. It's the second word in our list regarding the four essentials for victory that Paul gives us. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And then he says this, soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. Circle the words, don't get tied up. Don't get tied up. We're going to look at what that means here in a second. And then, for they, they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. Circle the words, please the officer. Please the officer. So what do we have? We have endure, suffering, don't get tied up, please the officer. And these, in essence, are the four essentials that we're talking about this morning for victory. What do, what, what do, what do, we, what do they come out to? What do we say? The first one I want you to write down this morning is simply this. Number one, don't be a quitter. Don't be a quitter. You remember on the playground? You remember on the playground? What, were the, what, was the, what, were, what was the wisdom given to us on the playground? Quitters never. Quitter, and man, that is so true, isn't it? If you quit, you can never win. Quitters never win. A marathon is how many miles? Anybody? 26.2. Two miles. What if I just run the 26? I've gone most of the way, right? I mean, 26, that's a whole lot. But if I give up at the 26 and don't do the point two, then I don't get the prize. I haven't completed the race. But so often in life, we go and we go and we go and we run and we run and we run and we get exhausted, we get tired, we get to the point where we go, I can't take it anymore, and we quit, we give up. We bail out before the blessing that God has for us. Don't be a quitter. Don't be a quitter. Those of you who are in the military, associated with the military, a spouse of those in the military, you know what A-W-O-L stands for, right? Anybody? Absent without leave. Going AWOL means absent without leave. You've bailed. You, have, you don't have permission and you disappear. You shirk your responsibility. You, you, you don't fulfill your duty absent without leave. Now, the reason I bring that up is, I'm, guys, I'm, I'm going to pick on you just a little bit today, okay, guys? And I hope you'll allow me to do that. Every time I do this, every time I, I, I speak just to the guys, I get an anonymous card, okay? <laughs> I do. Uh, some dude writes out, why are you always picking on us guys? And that's so mean and, and everything. But, but listen, if you're that guy, you might, you might be batting 500, man. You might be killing it. And maybe I'm not talking to you. But I, I want to talk to the guys in general. And the reason is because by and large, in our society, in this world in which we're living, there have been a lot of men who have gone AWOL. There's been an enormous void in leadership where there should be those stepping into leadership. Instead, they've stepped out of leadership. 
There are those who have gone AWOL regarding a relationship with a woman. You might be able to get with a woman, and you might be very proud of that. You might feel better about yourself than that, but are you willing to go the distance in commitment? Are you willing to stand in a committed relationship marriage, being a leader in that marriage, being a leader in that home and in that family? Or instead, will you go AWOL? We go AWOL in a lot of different ways. I mean, I, mean, I might not, we can go AWOL and not be physically at home. We can be absorbed so much in our job. We can be so much absorbed. We can, we can even actually be, be, be here physically, but not here mentally in our homes. I can be so into the virtual world that I don't look into the real world, world in which I'm living. Are you, are you AWOL? Are you absent without leave in your marriage, guys? How about with your kids? How about with your kids? Are you investing in them on a regular basis? Are you pouring in them? Are you leading them? Are you guiding them? You see, so very much, I believe, that we look around in this world in which we're living, we have so many kids who are wandering wandering around aimlessly with no direction in life because somebody has gone AWOL. Somebody has deserted the home and the family. Instead of stepping into their duty, they stepped out of their duty. And I want to challenge you, step back into that duty. Re-enlist. Get plugged back in. Be that godly husband. Be that godly father. Be that one who leads their family to church and leads them in worship and leads them in studying in the word of God. Please don't shirk that responsibility. Second Chronicles chapter 15 Verse 7 says, but as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Don't be a quitter. The word is endure, 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 endure. Don't stop, don't stop, don't give up. The second word was suffering that I had you circle. And in the four essentials for us to have victory, for us to get to the end of our life and look back and go, that was a win. The second one I want you to write down is simply this. Number two, prepare for difficult days. Difficult days. Suffering. Do you find it surprising in the Bible that Paul is telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, you're going to have some tough times. Hey, Timothy. There's going to be some suffering that comes your way. Hey, Timothy, it's part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Hey, Timothy, it's part of what it means to be a Christian. There are some tough days, I think so often. And in fact, it's been taught that if I become a Christian, well, then it's God's responsibility to basically keep me free of any real hurts or pains or sorrows. And there are actually those who go on and we believe some, well, God can do anything. and It's God's job to fix everything in my life. It's God's job to keep everything good and nice and perfect. It's God's, it's God's job to, to guard me, to protect me from any kind of suffering. And the reason I believe so many of us think that way is because when suffering does come for some, they're not ready, they're not prepared for it, and suddenly in their mind they're going, God, you didn't do your job. God, you owe me. And because you didn't do your job, because you allowed this in my life, I'm going to turn my back on you. And the truth is you're not turning your back on the real God. You're turning your back on the fake God that you created in your mind. You see, it's not the real God. It's not the real God who has promised to keep you from any hurts or sorrows or pains or suffering. In fact, the true God often takes us right to that suffering. He takes us to that suffering and then through that suffering. Oh, man, there's a movie out, movie out right now. I'm so excited. Anybody know? Anybody know? Top Gun, man. How many of you, how many of you remember the first one that came out? Whew, man. I remember going watching that movie right after that. I went and played some volleyball. Man. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, what a cool movie. I want to be Maverick, man. That would be Maverick and, and, and to be out there and, and, and there's a song that goes with Top Gun. I think they probably still have the same song playing, but, but the words of the song were 
highway to the danger zone, right? Going to take me right into the danger zone. Do you guys realize that when you start following the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes he takes you right to the danger zone, right to the unsafe place. He takes you right there to a place of hurt and pain and suffering. In fact, I, I want to do this real quick. Um, raise your hand if you have had any suffering in your past. Yeah, that's about everybody, right? Okay. Let me ask this. Be honest with me today. How many of you are going through some kind of suffering right now? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you this. You're going to have some more suffering tomorrow. And the next week. And the next week. In fact, it's very much a part of this life that we're living, walking by faith in the Son of God, who will take us to that danger zone, who will take us to even those painful places. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. Right there we find out that it's a battle that's going on. It's a battle in this world that we're living. We live in a fallen world, and because of that, there is pain and there is suffering. But can God do something in and through that pain and suffering? In fact, why is it that he would take us to the danger zone? And perhaps it's because he's building something inside of us that honors him and glorifies him, the very character of his son, Jesus Christ. Talk about Top Gun. I'm kind of proud to talk about this, guys, because but, but my grandfather was like one of the original Top Gunners. And what I mean by that is he, he, he flew, if you know anything about the, the planes in World War II, he, was, he, was a, he flew a P-51 Mustang. And uh, how many of you know what that is, the P-51 Mustang? Yeah. Uh, P-51 Mustang was the, the small plane that was an aerial combat and it had a really powerful engine, really loud, powerful engine. And he would fly that plane. His job was to escort the bombers in over Germany. And if any, any of Germans would start flying there, they, he'd get into a dogfight with them. I, I was amazed. I, I, when, I, when my grandfather passed away, we're going through the stuff in his house uh, with my grandmother. And she pulls out these, uh, these old uh, movie, little tiny movie reels. And I was like, what is this? And, and she, she, she was able to put them on VHS so we could watch them. And I was amazed because uh, when my grandfather would be flying this P-51 Mustang, every time he would start to shoot that big gun on the top of his plane, it would click something so that it would start to film what, what he was actually doing. And I got to see the actual films of him firing on these German planes and the tracer bullets that were going out as he was in the middle of that dogfight. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I, I didn't know he was that, that, that heroic. I didn't know that he was that, that, that unafraid. Or maybe I didn't know that he was, he was that, wow, to be able to watch him do that. But you see, I, I never knew him really. Uh, much like that because he wouldn't talk about it much. Instead, I knew him as the farmer that he was. And it was, it was about this time every summer uh, I might have to go spend some time on the farm with, with him and my grandmother. And, and uh, that was back in the day when, when children get, didn't get paid to work, you know? <laughs> Any of you remember those days? Yeah, I was free help, man. And I, back down there on that farm... Uh, I remember those days where he'd send me out into the in, 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 out there into the barn. The big had a big old dairy barn out there, and it was my job. You see, the, he, he was raising uh, black Angus cows, and the cows would come into the barn and they'd eat and they'd leave the barn, but then they'd leave a lot of stuff in the barn. And it was my job to get that shovel and you go from one end to the next, scraping it on the floor. We, we called them cow pies back then, but we know it as manure, right? And we would scrape, or my job to scrape up the manure there on the farm. What would you do with manure? Would you throw it out? No, man. You, you don't waste. You use that stuff. And we have to go and take it and put it into the garden and till it into the soil and, 
And because everybody knows that when you mix the manure in the, in the soil, it, it produces really good crops and vegetables and fruits. And do you, you, were you here a couple, few weeks ago when Pastor Neil was saying the fruit, of the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. You remember that? When he was talking about a crop, produce, what am I saying? I think you know what I'm saying. In fact, let me ask again. How many of you have had some manure in your past? How many of you have got some manure right now? Guess what? You're going to have some more manure tomorrow <laughs> and the next week. But do you realize that God is able to take the manure of your life and by his spirit turn it into something beautiful coming out of your life? Amen. It's the very suffering, the very, those very things that you're going through right now. It, Joseph had it right. Remember Joseph had it right. And all that garbage, all that junk that happened to him. And at the end of it, he says, you know what? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good for such a time as this. So, friend, if you find yourself up to here right now in manure, just know God is working in you to do something great if you let him. If you let him. Stay alert, he says. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 through 9. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And you guys know you can turn the news on. And you know that that is a real verse. And that is a real statement and there is a real enemy. When you look at what happened in Texas, when you look at what happened in Buffalo, you know that evil is real. And Satan is at work, and he is on the attack. But what are we to do? He says, stand firm. Stand firm against him. Our tendency? Well, maybe I should run. Maybe I should hide. Maybe I should turn it off and ignore it. Maybe I should go AWOL because it's too tough. He says, stand firm. Stand firm. Be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. And there's a battle. I love as we look through God's word, and we'll do a study on this sometime, guys, but do you realize that, that all throughout God's word, anytime God shows himself in a significant way, to an individual, he does it in a particular place. Anybody know that place? I'll tell you, the wilderness. The wilderness. I love that, that the word wild is part of the wilderness. You know what the wilderness in the Bible is? The wilderness in the Bible, is, are, it's those places where if God doesn't intervene, you're dead. If God doesn't intervene in the wilderness, then you're dead. If God doesn't make water come shooting out of this rock, then you're dead. If God doesn't make manna fall from heaven in the wilderness, then you're dead. And it's in the wilderness where God reveals himself in unique ways. It's Moses in the wilderness. Moses, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. It was the children of Israel in the wilderness. And God gives them the Ten Commandments. It's Elijah out in the wilderness. And God shows him who he is in this still, small voice. It was Jesus in the wilderness. And he was tempted. It's the wilderness. But it's there in the wilderness that God is doing something significant. And so many of us find ourselves so very often in the middle of the wilderness. Where if God doesn't show up, then we're as good as dead. But you see, it's at that point, it's at that point. That we see him, we see a new side of him, a new character of him. He reveals himself to us. 
but we must be ready. We must prepare. Prepare for those difficult days that are to come. Uh, four essentials for victory. Don't be a quitter. Number two, prepare for, vi- prepare for difficult days. And then number three, remember the mission. Remember the mission that you have been put on. In other words, there's a reason why you're here. And Paul says, hey, don't get tied up, Timothy. Don't get distracted. Uh, know why you're really here and what you're really here to do, what your real purpose is on this planet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to kind of grade yourself a little bit real quick. Um, scale of 1 to 10. Scale of 1 to 10. Um, how well are you doing at fulfilling your mission that you've been given to by God here on this planet? Just kind of real quick, uh, scale of 1 to 10. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because Kim and I were watching uh, the other night Steve Harvey, Family Feud. And uh, you guys know how the game show goes, right? And uh, we're sitting there watching it, and, and uh, one family ends up winning, the other family sulks off, and then they call two people over, and they're going to play for $25,000. And there's a list of questions, and each person has to go through the list of questions, and they try to get points for each question. And the first question was this. On a scale of 1 to 10, my wife and I are sitting there watching this. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your marriage? I go, 10. And my wife goes, (laughs) 8. What? I just gave you a 10. And she goes, oh, I don't know, I'm kind of thinking eight. Eight's the right answer. <laughs> How can, what? I gave you a ten, and you gave me an eight. I'm still trying to figure out what those two points are, how I missed those. Because I would give myself a ten. Marriage, ten. And I got an eight. Why am I saying that? Because here's, here's how it goes, I found so often for us. Uh, a second ago, I asked you on a scale of 1 to 10, rate how it is you're doing at fulfilling your mission here on this planet. And some of you go, 10! 10! And, and, uh, and God says to me, um, hmm. Now, Bo, maybe two. Maybe two. What do you mean? Ten. Ten, because I went to church last week. Ten. Uh, you might have gone to church last week, but have you spent time seeking me? Have you spent time talking with me this week? Ten. You know what? When I, I put some money in the plate. Okay, okay. But maybe have, have you given me your whole heart? What I really want? Ten. And maybe he says two. Because there's so much more that he would want to do if I would simply surrender myself to him. Completely, wholly, fully. You see, uh, we miss it. We miss what it's all about. Let me read this to you. 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 12. But you, Timothy, are a man of God. What does that mean then? So run from all these evil things. Now, here's the thing. I want you to circle the words evil things. I'm going to get back to that real quick. Uh, It might surprise you what's before this verse regarding evil things. But we'll get back to that in a second. He says, pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. He says, fight the good fight. For the true faith, hold tightly to the eternal life. Circle the words eternal life. To which God has called you. My purpose on this planet, the mission that I've been given to stay focused on that, to really love God, and as a result of loving God, he works in me to love others, to love people, to live that out. How well am I doing on that mission? Am I sticking to the mission? I had you circle these words, evil things, and and so often when we think evil things, all we think of, oh, this this is this sin and this sin and this sin and this sin. But you know what's right here that he says are the evil things that he says, watch out, be careful, stay away from? You can go back and look. You can read it. He says it's basically that pursuit of all the stuff 
that we think will make us happy in life. All the goods, he even uses the word greed in there. And he says, when we live that life of going, I'm going to make it all about what I can get for me and make my life. He says, man, run from that. Run from that. That's how we get so tangled up so often. We forget what it really is all about and the life of service and the life of sacrifice, the life that is led by him and being willing to lay down my life so that some, uh, somebody may live. Fight the good fight for the true faith, he says. Hold tightly to the eternal life. And I want you to circle those words, eternal life. And the reason is because when we see eternal life, it puts in perspective this little life. That we're living today. How many of you know what a mayfly is? Anybody know what a mayfly is? You probably heard of them before, but a mayfly, um, yeah, they're these little tiny kind of water bugs with wings and so forth. And uh, but here's the interesting thing about a mayfly: is a mayfly's lifespan is only one day long. One day long, which is why you wouldn't buy your kid a mayfly for a pet, right? It's only one day. Now, here's the deal. If you in this moment could, could speak wisdom to a mayfly, what would you say? I don't know what you'd say. I, I would say, hey, mayfly. Hey, mayfly, let me just tell you, you think you got all the time in the world, but you don't. Hey, mayfly, you better get about what really matters in your life because you don't got much time. Hey, Mayfly, you're not going to be here long. Hey, Mayfly, get moving and don't waste your life. But in light of eternity, is not the wisdom from God's word yelling at you and I, hey, human, you think you got all the time in the world, but you don't. Hey, human, you better get on with what really matters in life. Hey, human, hey, human, don't waste your life. Hey, human, pursue what really, really matters. And he says, pursue righteousness, godly life along with faith and love and perseverance gentleness fight the good fight for the true faith we must remember our mission and then finally the last number four is to live then for the glory of God live for the glory of God he says you can't please the officer if you're so tied up in these other things but it's really about being able to please the one who enlisted you giving him all the glory Glory, let me tell you what glory means real quick. Um, in, in scripture, the word glory means weightiness, kind of a weird word. Weightiness or heaviness or in essence matter. Um, God's glory comes and it's boom, it's heavy, it's big. And glory means that significance, what really does matter. And what we don't realize is so many of us, uh, without even knowing, all day, every day are looking for glory. We're looking to gain some glory, to have some, something that matters. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish uh, philosopher, and I told you guys this before, says anxiety comes from the fear of becoming nothing. And a lot of us don't realize how deep that fear goes, which is the reason why we have so much anxiety. But deep down, if we trace it all the way back, it really comes out to what if I'm nothing? What if I'm nothing? What if nothing comes of my life? What if there's no significance whatsoever? What if this doesn't matter at all? And so as a result, we go trying to pursue glory, to find glory. And maybe we, we think it, it, it's if I can get these people over here clapping and approving of me, if I can get my parents to say, oh, I'm proud of you. Oh, I get some glory for myself. If I can get this plaque that I can put on my wall from work where I achieve this and everybody comes to my office, I can go, look at that. 
Look at that. That means I'm something. That means I'm somebody. Or if I can get all these likes, all these likes. Or, oh, you're so beautiful. You're so gorgeous. You're so amazing. After I post a picture, well, I'm getting this glory for myself. But here's the problem. All that glory that we can collect simply, it's like sand through our fingers. It disappears and leaves us emptier than ever. Except for one kind of glory. And this is the mystery. This is the, the real glory, the true glory, what really matters. And it's found in this verse, Colossians 1.27. This is the secret. You want to know the secret? This is the secret, he says. Christ lives in you. And this, this is what gives you assurance of sharing in his glory. Being shaped and molded into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ living in you. Having his way with you. And that's where we see true glory is God. And that's, a, that's the place where any glory we have one day, what do we do? We find ourselves with that crown and we throw that crown down at the feet of the one who deserves it. The Lord Jesus Christ. I want to finish real quick with this, guys. Sergeant Alwyn Cash. C-A-S-H-E. Cash. Earlier this year received the highest honor given for somebody in combat. It was the Medal of Honor. He wasn't here to get it. In fact, he died 16 years ago. In Iraq, it was one evening he was given the mission along with his platoon to get into those Bradley armored vehicles. There were to be three, but one was breaking down, so it only took two. Because there were only two, Sergeant Cash said, we're in the lead, and, and they set out on their mission. Their mission was to go to this small town and, and make sure it was secure so that supplies could get through. There were only two miles away from camp when suddenly there's an explosion, a roadside bomb. The explosion hit that armored vehicle so hard it shot everybody up to the roof. And when they fell back down and looked around, pretty much everybody was on fire. And that's when those who survived were witness to what happened next. It was Sergeant Cash when nobody could find a way out, went through the flames in a window and one by one grabbed soldier after soldier and pulled them out to safety. The way they described seeing him, though, was the fire had pretty much melted his entire uniform off his body. But even then, when the rescue team came and the helicopters flew in he refused to get on the helicopter first because there were others who needed to be taken care of each soldier remembers seeing him last as wandering around with over 72 percent of his body burned and no clothes on it was three weeks after he suffered those burns that Sergeant Cash passed away. But that image in your mind should be the image of somebody chose to go through the fire to save somebody from the fire. And today I want to leave you with the image that somebody chose to go through the fire to save somebody from the fire. That mind, lay down your life. There is no greater love. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you, and that's what he calls you and I to become ourselves.
following in his character through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow in a word of prayer. If you don't know Jesus, it starts there, guys. It starts with calling out to him, talking with him. If you don't know Jesus right here, right now, maybe being melted by the love that he has for you, you'll say, Jesus, I want to receive you as my Savior. Come into my life and forgive me of my sin. And be my God and my Savior and my friend, my friend forever and ever. Yes, Jesus, save me, please. And friend, when you pray that prayer, you mean with your heart, the Bible says you can know that you have eternal life. Somebody went through the fire to save you from the fire. Now, Father, may our lives be dedicated completely to you that we surrender our hearts, our souls to your will. Father, let your spirit work in and through us, shaping us to be like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.